DeSantis decertified the area that did that in Florida. And then you have Tennessee who's like, well, we don't want that to happen here. So we're going to pass this bill to make sure it doesn't happen. We're going to include I things like this. I super, I super don't think you're right. I don't think so. Then, then, why did they, then why did they pass this? Why did they but who judges what is imminent? How is that judged? That is going to be a person drawing a line. So, so, wait, so we're saying on the grounds of like the undermining of the election could potentially mm -hmm. lead to violence. Yes, no, I've read that bill, and that's like, that can, that bill is like one of the most misrepresented. Hold on, I want to fight over this for a second. Um, Go ahead. Welcome to yet another episode of WIC TV, a cross-ideological space where people can come together from different walks of life to talk. And, uh... I, if Gideon wanted in on this, he's allowed to be in on this. I think he'd make an interesting thing, but I don't know if he does. Uh, let me uh, let me start by apologizing. Um, Iona fell ill. Uh, she was initially supposed to be here and talking to us, uh, but she messaged me about two hours ago that she wasn't going to be able to make it. She had a, a huge migraine and just could not uh, attend. So I Wait, who is this person? Iona Italia. She's the chief editor of Aereo Mag Magazine. She's uh, written for Quillette. Um, uh, she dodged 100%. I'm not buying it. She's been on my show before. She knew what With she was me? getting to, right? So, uh, I don't believe it. Fair enough. Maybe. Uh, regardless... Uh, she could have, uh, it could have been a, could have been a great show, but it'll be a great show because we have Lactoid to replace her. So Lactoid, yeah. I appreciate you coming in last minute and talking to us. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. and with this, we're going to talk about tech censorship today. Uh, I watched a panel with Destiny, uh, and Alex Jones at the Minds Fest that he recently did. And I was very disappointed in how that went. And I thought that this was an interesting enough topic that we could talk about it in a more, um, productive manner and so i've gathered a team gang to discuss this and we'll see how it goes and i guess i i just ask first of all straight up um is twitter and other social media companies right um have they become the de facto town square what do we think gang? are we going around in circles or is this up to you call? anyone wants to jump in go ahead well my immediate I after you uh, I would, my opinion, I think, is that the totality of like the three or four big social media companies has become like the town square, and they seem to be kind of lockstep in terms of moderation policies. So like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok, I guess, like those four, would probably be like this is like the new town square. Okay, everyone agree with that? Is are we? Are I we... I don't. Okay. Um, the first thing that occurs to me is that you say has it become the new town square, and when I think about there's 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 two uh, angles that I would take issue with that statement. The first is that has it become the new town square from what? Were we were we all assembling in some wide open space uh, with a bunch of robots in addition, um, just like yelling random stuff at random strangers and then swiftly disappearing back into the crowd to come again in a later time to do the same thing over and over again? That's not typically what we have in mind when we think of the town square. What we Can think I of enter we something say, there just as a quick thing? Please. I I think wasn't weren't that wasn't that didn't that actually used to be the case that there were like people like screaming on corners and shouting and like holding pamphlets and no no, no like 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 town town hall meetings were very disorderly the, the issue that I I'm bringing up is not the the chaoticness of the actual thing itself the point is that there's an interminability and and a kind of unenclosedness to Twitter and to social media that a town square lacks like among other things we're, which town right like we're not talking about a, a a community somewhere deliberating about like public action we're talking about randos from across different borders sometimes once again like not even actual people just throwing things and at no point does this culminate in deliberation or an actual increase in public knowledge maybe sometimes it does but it's not fulfilling the function in a liberal society that i think the town square analogy is supposed to uh is is trying to put its finger on it's more of like a national town square right so um and I think this is especially true when public congregations uh, are get banned, perhaps like, like, let's say, during a pandemic, where the only option you really have is to congregate online. Um, and just like in the regular town square, you have people who, you know, say stupid things, raise their hand, yell. And you have people who are, you know, standing off on the side, maybe having more intricate conversations. I, I don't um, just because one happens to be like a 
more physical place as opposed to like an electronic place. I don't think that really detracts from the spirit of when we call it a town square, right? This, it is supposed to be a place for discussion, right? A place for, uh, for ideas to be uh, exchanged. I don't want to monopolize. May I respond to that quickly? Okay. Um, I don't disagree with you entirely. I think it definitely takes on some of the functions and even monopolizes some of the functions of what we associate with the town square image. Um, but once again, like that doesn't seem to me to indicate that it fulfills the function of a town square. Perhaps it was the case that we lacked entirely for a brief period of time, maybe a long period of time, the function of a town square from, from like public discourse. And then as a result of social media, certain aspects of that were brought back in a potentially toxic and dangerous way. Well, what is, um, maybe we should ask ourselves then, what is the function of a town square? And then we can figure out if it satisfies that or not. So we're all working on the same definition. Well, I think for myself, the function of a town square is a forum where members of a discrete community can come together and address uh, their respective issues, um, decisions that affect the whole of the community, and they can weigh in, and then decision can be reached about how these things are going to be addressed. Is, and then is it people that deep? disperse and go back. Is, is it that, that deep? Like, as I understood it, uh, historically, a town square is just where people gathered and talked about shit, right? It usually wasn't a formal yeah. issue, right? Like, they would get up in their soapbox and maybe discuss issues of the day. But w this concept comes, goes back a long ways, right? And and you're right about the discrete community. It was it was localized uh, mm -hmm. by uh, dent of it had to be, right? They didn't have yeah. any other uh, ways of long-distance communication. But, like... Uh, it, it was never really so formal and in different uh, areas had different mores and different norms surrounding it. But yeah, I, as I understood well, it, at least the town square was simply a yeah. place where people gathered to talk about what they thought, right. And discuss issues well, of the day. Well, a town square was a marketplace. So I'm collapsing two things together. So the value of a town square, why we care about that particular thing is not because there's some intrinsic value of one random person getting up in a box and screaming to a crowd. That person could be ignored and nothing could happen as a result. That happens in a lot of different places. However, if you have a robust community where people are engaging with each other on their day-to-day -day as they're passing through their places of work and places of purchase and places of leisure and so on and so forth, um, you end up with a situation, at least in the ideal scenario, where the things that people are belting out to the crowd are also addressed by members of the crowd in a way where there's some commensurateness between the person speaking and the crowd that's responding to them. On Twitter, by contrast, and I was talking about this with Aaron earlier, um, a, a rando who goes onto Twitter starts off with zero followers, has no capacity to be heard at all. Someone shouting back at the person in the town square, by contrast, does. What happens when we consider social media like Twitter and YouTube to be the town square, much more so with Twitter, is that we substitute celebrity culture with politics and i think that's where it becomes dangerous because now real political influence can be gained by propping up people as celebrities donald trump or some other major figure uh has has the poor judgment to respond to somebody that person now becomes a major player that's actually a really dangerous uh, set of dynamics i think and mm -hmm. it's not discreet to any particular community so um it doesn't seem like it actually culminates in any kind of decision if anything it, it arrests mm -hmm. Uh, right, and yeah. what is the equivalent of like a counter protest at like a t like a online in a town square? Unless if you're going to say that like uh, mm. the example that Sunday and I talked about was Richard Spencer. If I'm trying to counter protest what Richard Spencer is using his social media platform to do on Twitter, is that like a um, what like a ratio? Is that supposed to be the equivalent of like countering them? Quote um, tweets, quote tweets, and like retweets and giving your argument. Yeah, you know, posting furry porn or like I've seen people do a lot of weird things when it comes online for one interesting form of a digital protest. Actually, it's not exactly the same thing. But when that um, was it, Texas opened up their lines to like report people for being trans or something. Or was it was that Florida or Minnesota or something uh, that happened? And then a bunch of people like did a bunch of fake phone calls and got the phone call line shut down. Right. Uh, there's ways to like protest people online, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And even on Twitter, by yeah, whether it's ratios or posting images or retweeting or quote tweeting people, whatever. Right. And oh, hash abortion right? in Texas. Sorry. I mean, hashtag seems to be like that's the whole thing. That there's a reason why like they trend. There are uh, ways there... to reply. Oh, sorry, go on. No, oh, uh, so continue. But I, I asked that question to ask others, and I, I'm curious. Uh, but continue okay. with your your thought. Yeah, um, there are certainly ways in which individuals, even with no following whatsoever, can technically respond. 
However, now we run into the question of whether or not it's, it satisfies the conditions of an open forum where uh, somebody can respond but categorically can't be heard because the system itself, for reasons that are inscrutable to most people, for legitimate reasons, um, uh, they, they just have no uptake or no visibility. Um, there, there are some people who will respond to very big figures, and they'll make a very pointed point, and it will just go unseen. Whereas at the very least in a literal town square, when you shout back, somebody around you hears. Maybe the person you're even shouting at hears. That Do you is not, not think the they had like Twitter celebrity can... status back then too, though? Like if the town mayor or Socrates, yeah. right, walked in, obviously people were going to defer to them more, much more so than strangers, right? Oh, of course. Like no, no this... the, the issue the issue I'm pinpointing isn't um, that celebrities and important officials and whatnot will always have an advantage in any public space. Obviously they do. They're better known, whatever. Um, the difference, though, is that in an actual town square, just because of physical proximity, mm -hmm. I'm not saying we need to bring back the town square itself. It's infeasible. The, the point is whether or not this, this counts as one. In an actual town square, um, the, the, uh, the square itself okay. is not so designed that a smaller person saying something is actually muted. Like they actually physically cannot be heard. Fair enough. Um, I asked that, though, because I also wanted to ask something that Destiny asked uh, the Alex Jones and the other panelists there that I don't think a, he got a good answer for. And I'm curious, given his stance on this as kind of like the de facto public square, uh, what his answer would be to the question. And that's, should it be a company or corporation's responsibility to uh, guard free speech or to make sure that the their customers or the people that are participating on the site have access uh, to information outside of their bubble. And what does that even look like? Uh, what do we think, gang? If you think, right, that the uh, social media has become the town square, right, um, do the, the people that own the town square and operate the town square have any responsibility to make sure that people are heard? Their only the, responsibility the... is going to be to make money and maximize profits. And so far as they're going to be concerned about that, it will only be to cover their ass when it comes to liability. It's not really going to be in the interest of promoting one idea over the other. I think, I, I think, w with respect, Vic, I think the question itself is a bit fraught. You're asking if, like, a private company owns the 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 space of public discourse, and I don't think that's that's really an apt comparison for one well thing well to... yes you you do, you disagree that it's a, a public town square right um but for those like lactoid or or oh. destiny even who say well, well they, i mean let's they let's do, right well let's 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 pretend that it is for a second though right um in that case uh now the responsibility becomes whatever the public determines it to be now we've directly linked the responsibilities of the companies because they are uh presiding over a a specifically public service that is being anointed as like a central part of democratic deliberation um if if a if a democratic society determines that it should be legally responsible there, there really is no ethical component to this that is the ethical link it is directly connected to law um here we run into the additional problem though and why characterizing it as a public space is is, is an issue in the first place um whose public space we have people from russia we have people from canada we have people from the united states even in this panel we have multiple nationalities present um, it's, it's, it's managed according to whose lights, like who, right. who Lact gets, Lactoid yeah. said, this is like a national conversation, but really like Twitter is host to international users and it's going to expand. Like right now, our conceptions of like what constitutes free speech is going to be biased in favor of like the first amendment and stuff like that. But Sunday is a Canadian, uh, Lactoid obviously are an American, My apologies. Um, but like <laughs> the uh, European conception of free speech is going to be in incredibly anemic compared to the American, but I'm just biased to say that. Um, I don't know that Twitter, like, adopting any sort of, like... Um... Well, I, I, that just begs the question, like, uh, which... Wait, hold on. Is Wick moderating this panel, or are you debating I... on this panel? <laughs> I'm trying to. Wick, Wick is, I, uh, doing both. Oh, I got a, I got a few, I got a few points, right? So, uh, to answer the question directly, uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Companies have, like, a responsibility to, to freedom of speech. It's always so odd to me that, like, otherwise very lefty peoples very lefty people will just like for some reason like when you ask them about censorship right this is why i think authoritarianism is actually often like their underlying motive for most things um yeah. when you like when it comes to like uh terms of censorship like they immediately flip into like the most free market like and cap you can possibly imagine 
well, no, they just, you know, they're just there to um, make profit. We can't even criticize them, right? We shouldn't even be able to like come together and say, well, no, like, fuck you. Uh, like you were, you were managing freedom of speech in this country and you're basically reducing it and eating away at it and eating away at the spirit of what it was intended to do. Um, as to how that affects other countries, I mean, ultimately, I wish American free speech uh, interpretation was the law in all countries. Ideally, America would be the country, but that's a whole different conversation. I feel like the other countries thing is kind of a red herring. Um, like, who cares how other countries manage it? We should probably manage it according to U.S. standards, right? And then you would do whatever compliance you need to exist as a service in those countries. But, like, we obviously we have our... Uh, standards here like if one country said it was okay to have child porn we wouldn't be like oh well we need to make sure that twitter like works for them in the united states we would moderate in the united states based on whatever we think our u.s values ought to be there are sure, but its function its function as a public space though is not dependent on the place in which its head offices are situated or, or where it's where the well, it kind of is located. yeah i would expect like a company that's situated in britain to operate under british values no no i'm not i'm not i'm not i'm not disagreeing with that but what i'm saying though is that the argument that it fulfills the role of a public square that is satisfied regardless of whether or not the company itself is situated legally in the United States or elsewhere. For example, it fulfills the same function in Canada as it does in the United States. It fulfills the same uh, uh, function in, in the UK. As oh, it sure, does it the can, but I, that, it's, yeah. a, it's a fundamentally different question for them as Canadians because they're using a US-based company for their town square, which is kind of weird. That would be a weirder question, but that'd be for them to answer, I guess. Or they could pass laws if they feel like they want to see reform or change, like from a legal process. But... Well, yes, but I don't think Lactoid's argument would change if, for example, Twitter was located in Canada or the UK. Lactoid, would it change? I, I mean, here, from like we a, can ask him. From, from like a legal perspective, yeah, I guess it would change because it would be domiciled in a different country and it would have different rules applied to it. But well, like, exactly. I'm, You're I'm, not I'm, talking I'm, about the legal perspective. I'm not talking about that, right? I'm talking about, I'm like, well, the I think moral, even from a moral an ethical, responsibility. Well, no, even, yeah, exactly. Even from a moral responsibility, it would change. If Facebook passed a law saying that women needed to cover, or not a law, I'm sorry. If Facebook passed a rule saying that in every picture of a female, the female needed to wear the hijab, right? And males needed to accompany them in public in all public pictures. Obviously, I would protest the fuck out of this. This is crazy, okay? But if somebody made like a Muhammad book or something, and it was like from fucking Saudi Arabia, and it was popular online, and that was their role, I was like, okay, well, I mean, that's, it's Saudi Arabia is like social media. If they, if they want to have this fucking role in their shit, I mean, it makes sense. It's like, I'm not about to tell them, you need to go change your platform to comport with my American values. That wouldn't make any sense. So I think that the company, uh, the company headquarters and like where they, the company comes from is, is actually kind of important, I think, to the, the ethical question. Of it it does. I just don't think it touches on the public square question. I'm not it, it disagreeing yeah. with anything that you're saying. I, well, I, think, I think like think there's an ethical like if the responsibility. Square, if the public square is owned by a foreign company, they, well, it's not a public square. Then it's it's owned by a company, which is this well, is but my that's, point. This we're is why the, the question. Public that's exactly what the point is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a public, public square, square owned by a totalitarian country. Is that really like a public free spare a square? I don't wouldn't think so. Like Saudi well, Arabia, maybe. But isn't that kind of what we're at right now? Because Facebook and uh, YouTube and all these things are in a way totalitarian. They don't answer to constituents. They answer to shareholders, right? Well, this is part part of the problem. Should they? <laughs> well, on that, let me ask: Should they? Should the government protect right uh, people's right? to its quote unquote right to be on social media and to have a voice on social media such as are you um, asking if we have a Twitter. constitutional right to a twitter account uh i'm asking if they should right. if you should have the uh, since you do in america at least have the right to freedom of speech and the government gonna... does protect you right to be able to have your right of freedom of speech in a public space, right? If you were in a public space passing out pamphlets for your stupid ass uh, belief system, no one can come and stop you from doing that, right? Um, not the government, not other people, etc. cetera. Uh, the government will protect you. Uh, should they not do so in social media as well? I think if uh, if major politicians like, like Joe Biden and Donald Trump are tweeting out a good portion of their messages, Maybe. Um, I, 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 I loathe uh, being on the side of lactoid in this, but unfortunately, if we're in a situation in which, um, like, these spaces are monopolizing over a specific type of political discourse that's very effective, whether or not I think that that's a good thing, um, I think you would need very strong reasons for excluding people from that. Yeah, I think we... had a good reason when he banned Trump, right? <laughs> Like, like it is like, no, on, 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 what do you mean? To ban Trump? Are you talking about? Oh, no, no, no. I'm saying Jack Dorsey single handedly thought that he had a compelling reason to ban, you know, a world leader at the time from his platform. 
And I guess he would defend that on the basis of I have the right to do that. It's my private company. This is not the yeah. town square, even though it's utilized by public officials. But should he be doing that? No, he should not. Or like he, sh he shouldn't have the ability to, as a, an individual actor, decide that he is not going to host a world leader. I wouldn't be comfortable if Jack Dorsey had banned Obama, you know? That case is tricky because at the time, Donald Trump uh, was fomenting what very well could have been an insurrectionary action, right? So it's... Yeah, like I think we can agree that even public officials, like if... If, you know, Biden gets on and just starts spamming the N-word, it's probably okay for him to get banned from Twitter, right? For blatant TOS violation. But if we're trying to say that Twitter is supposed to function as, like, the town square, then why would a why would a sovereign or, or a president ever be subject well, think, to that? I don't think I, you should be, actually. Well, I think, I think you should I'd be. Wanna I want to know if Biden was doing that. Well, I think in this particular case, though, um, Trump was engaging in something that I think would not even be acceptable within the context of, of, of normal politics anyways. Um, he was he was calling into question an election trying to overrun the will of the people as had been determined legally. Um, like, do I, you I, I don't think, know. I, I don't... Well, let me ask you directly, Sunday. Do you think uh -huh. that um, election denial or an election uh, questions about uh, the free and fair election in a country should... Uh, be censored by a toss company. Not whether they can or can't. I'm not asking legally whether they can or can't. But I'm asking: should should a company, should a corporation censor people questioning the legitimacy of an election? Well, that's uh, that, that's that's an impossible question to answer. Um, once once again, like where and and at whose behest? These are private companies. Um, the questioning the legitimacy of an election that's tantamount to like a, a prelude to a declaration of civil war you're saying that the the constitution has been overrun and the people have been betrayed by its leadership um there's only if, if you actually accept that thesis there's only two possible outcomes you concede to what you believe is tyrannical rule or you fight against it so the question is whether or not the, the people in a position of decision-making authority have what I would deem to be just reason to think that these claims are spurious. At okay. the end of the day, there's going to be a human being making these decisions. Well, the so rest so, wait, case case so we're saying on the grounds of like the undermining of the election could potentially mm -hmm. lead to violence, and that's why it needs to. It, it, there's a case for it to be deplatformed, even though it's coming from a public official? Because if, if, we're, if we're worried about right. like violence, right, significantly more Americans... Um, will have died from COVID-19 vaccine disinfo, right? Yeah. Then will, you know, from the insurrection or something like that. As far as I know, um, like less than three people died at the insurrection or something like that. Um, you know, if it were a murderer or something like that, this would be cut and dry. But if I'm like a Weinstein brother disseminating nothing but vaccine misinfo and I'm responsible for the deaths potentially of thousand, misleading thousands of people, you know, he's not going to be in a jail cell. He's going to be in a mansion. By the end of the night, I think Here's that the... there's a, well, I think there's a difference. I think some deaths we're willing to accept. We should be willing to accept a democracy. Other deaths we're not willing to accept. If, as part of our engagement of freedom of speech, some people end up spreading information that causes harm to other people, like we can call it stochastic terrorism if we want. That's a form of freedom of speech. That's a, that's a negative repercussion of freedom of speech that we accept as part of having the right to freedom of speech. So the COVID misinformation or anything else, we accept that. That's a, that's a cost of freedom of speech. However, a direct call to violence, it, we don't consider that freedom of speech. That's not a cost we're willing to bear. For somebody saying we should go out and kill all black people, like any deaths associated with that are too much because that type of speech has no value. We don't value that whatsoever. But we do value the ability to speak freely about things that other people might consider harmful, even if those things at the end of the day do manifest in some real harm. It's, it's a directive speech, not like an informative or inquisitive speech, right? That's the difference. And that's this is, well, no, not just directive, to be clear, because somebody could direct you not to get vaccinated, right? Technically. They can or also direct you not to get vaccinated using implicature, not a, not a direct statement that mm -hmm. somebody can clearly point to and say, hey, this unequivocally means this sentence in all cases. Like, no, it's I... always going to be subject to interpretation, or in many cases will be subject to interpretation. I think potentially that's different. I think if you tell, like, somebody on the internet, you should not get vaccinated or you should get vaccinated, like, I think that speech is much more on the table to get regulated than, like, talking about what you think the efficacy of vac uh, COVID vaccines are, right? One is, like, a direct call to something. You're not, like, having a discussion about the merits of it or, like, the underlying truth value, which is, like, ultimately the point of this. Um, the first part, though, 
is like the discussion of truth. And you don't think I mean, you should be able to like tell somebody like, hey, I think you should get vaccinated or hey, I don't think you should get vaccinated. I, I don't I don't think that obviously some calls to action like aren't bad enough to where like like imminent violence under different tests that I would consider them to be like those specific phrases to be banned. But I think that like the only like category of speech that I'm like willing to go after is going to be like uh, not not like truth seeking kind of like inquisitive speech, but more like go do this or let's all get together and do this. Right. Mm -hmm. One is directly. I think one's completely different than the other. So what if some very what if some very moneyed and well organized uh, actors um, flood the online space with misleadingly phrased questions that tend towards a specific interpretation. Like Purdue. Asking questions about um, like the efficacy of vaccines. Has this actually been adequately researched? Da, 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 da. And the direct implication, the read that most reasonable people who are otherwise uninformed will take from this is, I should probably hold off a little bit. And now you actually have a real public danger that's not just confined to one nationality. Now you have a real public danger where a bunch of people are suddenly holding off on the vaccine the disease meanwhile is spreading and like like you see how immediately uh, bring this up to climate change as well same deal you end up with an interminable kind of arrest of of action and address of of serious issues with a very short time scale um like like that that's a problem yeah lacto just is the threshold for you is that it has to be explicit and that anything short of that could not reasonably be interpreted as a true call to action uh, yeah. So I, I, my opinion on this like follows essentially like what the Supreme Court said in Brandenburg, right? The idea is it's got to be like imminent, like an imminent, a call to like imminent violence that has to be somewhat credible, right? There needs to be something behind it and it needs to be like imminent. Let's go do this like directive action because the, the, this like implication of, well, we can draw a line from then something like the truth seeking question that you're asking today to then like it's implied or like a reasonable person could intuit that this actually has like a directive kind of statement hidden within or someone could come to a directive statement like before you know it all speech is on the table right but like who judges now now we can censor uh people trying to call out purdue pharma you know the people who are like hey this shit's actually addicting well hold on are you telling or if you point out that's addicting then some people might not get it and so you're basically telling people to not buy oxycontin and so like they're dying or they're in tremendous amounts of pain we're going to censor you now like you can basically do anything but who judges what is imminent? How is that judged? That is going to be a person drawing a line at some at some level of analysis. That is an inevitable factor in every single censorship decision. Yeah, and I think this is like on the responsibility of companies to have like a much more transparent and clear TOS. Not like we're just going to ban hateful conduct. It's like we are going to like okay. in in this kind of situation, like example A, B, or C, or you know, if there's something that like according to I don't know U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, precedent or whatever about what is the definition of imminent uh, violent action or a call to, you know, credible threat of violence, things like this. That makes sense to me. So here's something interesting that comes about as a direct result of this flattening of, of social media that we were talking about earlier. Um, if someone yeah. like Donald Trump highlights a small account, slanders them, and by so doing increases their profile by orders of magnitude, and then somebody else piles in on that person, is that person therefore being criticized as as a public figure? I think that'd be a really hard sell. The, the difficult part is, yeah, like when it comes to a lot of this is case law, a lot of this is jurisdiction dependent, and a lot of this is going to be um, defining the exact lines is just it's just going to be there's no real clear answer here as to like what's a public figure uh, who's acting in the course of a public figure. Um, like what level of like malintent you have to show. I think as far as the law is concerned, isn't just, you know, malice is not going to have anything to do with like disliking somebody or a will. I think it's the only two things that you have to demonstrate is that the person knew that it was false or they were acting with like a reckless disregard um, for whether or not the statement was even true. Let me ask I'm you not... this. Wait, 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 hold on. Wait, is Lactor, are you like a lawyer or a law student guy? I'm a civil litigation attorney. I've been practicing for like two or three years. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, then you'll know anything more than me. Okay. Um, my understanding was what you're talking about from malintent. I thought that that was, um, it falls under the actual malice standard set by the New York Times v. Sullivan case, but that only applies to public figures. So like publishing incorrect information about a private citizen, I thought that that could get you in trouble for defamation. You don't have to prove that they were acting with malice if it's not a public first person, because for private citizens, um, the standards for defamation are way, way, way lower. That was my understanding. 
to avoid the chilling effect of publishing wrong information about like public figures. Well, well let me ask you I, this. I can explain. Oh. Well, wait, let him explain. If he's yeah, a boss, explain. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I, I guess I mean I, I probably misspoke. So let, let me explain a little bit. So when I'm talking about malintent, uh, so you, are you guys familiar with the like concept of like negligence? This idea mm -hmm. of like you have this like this obligation to somebody, and like you you violate that that obligation, right? Yeah. And so, like, you have an obligation to somebody to, like, uh, you know, if you, if you say something about somebody that is, like, wrong, that you know is wrong, and that is, like, going to cause damages, and you do so negligently, right, um, th I mean, technically, that's going to be the standard for a private citizen. Now, this is, again, more of, like, a just experience thing of, it just seems like in order to win those, like, you have to show some kind of... Well, like they, there's some kind of like hidden agenda, right? There was some kind of malintent, um, because, Wait, because otherwise, otherwise, how do you show negligence, right? How, how do you show that they were active? Because if they were given information, that Wait, was you like need malintent for negligence. Sound. That, that doesn't for, sound right. Wait, for negligence, you would just have to demonstrate that the person was not employing a reasonable level of scrutiny or care yeah. when they were publishing or making the statement. Um, and I think it's it's like it's that standard is way lower than like actual malice, right? Yeah, like if I negligently publish something about you, Lactoid, like somebody's like, oh, Lactoid's a rapist. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm going to publish that, right? You might be able to sue me for defamation because I'm being kind of negligent. But if somebody gives me that information about a public figure, right, we'll say Wick, massively popular panel host, and I publish True. it, that you, I have to actually meet a higher standard there to be sued for defamation. You'd have to show not only did you know it was wrong, you were like grossly negligent or malicious in your publishing the information. Yeah, like, did I'm, that person do everything that would be reasonably necessary to attempt to determine whether or not the statements that they were making were true? Um, when And, like, they could provide evidence that they were by showing research, editing, fact-checking their work, um, right. uh, trustworthiness of sources, stuff like that. Right. That's what, yeah, right, exactly. Like, you have to show, like, some level of, um, you know, hey, so, like, I wasn't negligent because of XYZ reason, even if the evidence is false. Out of curiosity, um, just for my own uh, edification... Um, do streamers count as public figures? So, for example, if they could. Um, if they could, okay. So, does there have to be a threshold? Like, for example, do you have to be Destiny sized, or could you? I'm be pretty small? sure all of that. None of this is going to be hard. I think this is all going to be argued in front of a judge. You've got to try to Fair convince enough. them, like this person for these purposes ought to be considered a public figure, essentially. Okay. It seems was... like it would always be relative too. So, like someone like Destiny versus someone like I don't know, like Asmund Gold, for example. I don't know off the top of my head what the relative sizes are, but I think it's roughly fifty percent larger. Um, like, would Destiny be considered a public figure in the light of, 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 a, of a suit against I guess figure, what I'm right? asking specifically is if someone were to read, like, the Destiny report that Mr. Girl released or see some of Lav's uh, accusations and then spread that, believing what they read, believing what they heard, right, and saying, oh, wow, Destiny did this and started talking and just spreading it to all corners, uh, would they... Uh, be liable uh, under uh, the law uh, to be considered defaming or because Destiny's kind of a public figure they wouldn't really be able to be targeted that way. I'm just I'm just curious. My guess would be because that report deals with me utilizing a large platform. In that case I would almost de facto be like a public figure because no, it's no, writing a report around no. a public person using a platform that like reaches a lot of people. That'd be my guess. That'd be pretty easy to argue. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, should right? Uh Social media companies be enforcing standards to definition. So if someone is engaged in what could reasonably be uh, assumed to be defamation, should co uh, corporate media companies uh, build that into their toss? Should honesty be built into toss? So if someone is purposely spreading misinformation, should toss put a stop to that or should it be allowed? What are we thinking? I don't think Lactoid can answer that question because fundamentally, once again, this is up to human interpretation. Someone's going to be making an inference that this claim is untrue Ooh. or that this claim is defamatory, that this claim is being made in, in, a, in a misleading fashion. So even like the asking of certain kinds of questions, for example, can imply like a certain statement and that can have like serious social effects individually or broadly. And so it's going to be up to some persons, hopefully some persons, judgment whether or not that that passes muster um i think in the case where it's been determined by law i think it's trivial at that point like obviously they they shouldn't allow that kind of thing to be spread if it's been determined legally to be defamation but otherwise 
Can you ask the question one more time, Wick? Sure. Um, should honesty be built into TOS? Should you should if you are found to be lying about someone or something be subject to moderation by a social media company? If you're found to be like willingly lying, willfully like you knew, lying, like, like you knew it for was example, false. right? Uh, you knew it was false, but you said that Lactoid is stinky. He has super stinky feet, and you just continually uh, told that lie to one and all, right? Uh, should a corporate media, a social media company, say we're gonna we're gonna pull your account, we're gonna stop you, we're gonna block you? Um, if you can demonstrate that this person was like knew that they were lying. Sure, and, you have text. Uh, text shown. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm way, I'm stinky. way more sympathetic. I'm way more sympathetic to like that, uh, to like regulation of that stuff and removal of that stuff than I am about somebody genuinely believing that this is the tr like a truth truth statement and then making that statement and the powers that be don't agree that it's actually the true statement. Wait, well, I don't think social media companies should have anything to do with defamatory claims. That's not. If you want to settle defamatory stuff, then you go because otherwise, like, what is the burden of of research put on social media companies to figure out like if a statement is true or false like hey john said that like i shit myself in school like i want to ban him because i think that statement is like are so do we really want social media companies in the business of trying to determine the how oh, true I, people gossiping about each other is yeah that's that's fair i don't know how much like i don't think i would put a lot of like i guess under two section 230 i wouldn't put like a ton of like weight like responsibility on social media companies to like affirmatively do this but like I can imagine a scenario of which like, oh, hey, it was determined by a court that this was false or hey, like, like, even though we didn't do like a we did like a minor investigation and we found out like it was a lie. Like this person. How about this? How about this? Here's here's a good. And I guess I'd be OK with it. Here's a good question. What if an account in Pakistan accuses somebody of urinating on the Quran? See, that that can that can uh, culminate in an actual uh, an actual immediate violence against that person if they're identifiable. Right. I just don't think social. It's just not something I would care for. That'd be like saying, like, do we think should should social media right. companies ban you if you've got like three felonies? Like, I don't know. I don't think that, like if you murder someone, should you get banned from Facebook? Oh. No, sure, but like in the event that defamation or or something sort of in the broad category of defamation results in immediate extra legal harm to an individual, or can be predicted to result in immediate extra legal harm to an individual. This can go from like the example I just gave to like accusations of somebody engaging in child grooming. For instance, um, would there is there not an argument then um, for a social media platform that becomes aware of this as a pattern? Like again, we can set like a certain threshold of awareness here, where they're aware this is a pattern, they're aware that this can have like serious consequences. Um, however, of course, given who they are and how they're operating and, and where they're situated, they don't have a way to actually determine the truthfulness of the statement. Or, in the case of the person who pissed on the Quran, if, if whether or not the statement is true. Um, arguably, like, like it seems to me that it, it's, it's fairly trivial. Like, the, the value of, of curtailing that is, is greater than... So, so to be clear, you would be flying. okay with, with banning uh, false accusations like that, right? I, I think it's a gray area where it would allow some level of flexibility. What if I did? What if I did piss in the Quran and this is like the one guy that saw it and then he accuses me and I just deny it? Well, like, what I'm getting at with this is that it really depends on, on where you're situated. So you, where you are, that will result in nothing happening to you. Maybe a couple of Muslims will get mad at you online. If you're, for example, a woman in Pakistan who is accused of this, that might result in your death. So it's different stakes. Again, though, should the social media company, right, be responsible for moderating that? And I don't know if they should, right? Well, um, it's like there's a different question of responsibility versus do they retain the right to do so? Mm. Fair, mm. right? Like, but we're I, rather than asking can they, uh, I'm asking should they? Well, I only asked the question of can they because I think it's only going to come, it's it's going to come down to a matter of size, like like truth social, right? Isn't this like a, a much smaller, like, kind of ripoff of, of Twitter? Or am I wrong? I think Truth sure. Social is this, but like, it, it's it a looks much, very close. Yeah. Right? It's a much smaller version of that. So if the creator and CEO of, of Truth Social comes out and they say, I don't want, as far as I can reasonably know, I don't want to assess, or like, I don't want to host, uh, like, convicted felons on my platform, or um you know liberals or people who i identify to be part of like xyz faction and stuff like that 
Um, I don't think people would really care. People would be like, well, you know, Truth Social is their platform. They can't be compelled by the state or really even socially encouraged to host just anybody. They have freedom of association, too. Um, And people wouldn't care. But if it came to Twitter, you know, and suddenly the CEO, like the boardroom of Twitter is starting to say that we don't want convicted felons on our platform or we don't want conservatives. Just now it's just a matter of like practicality and size where previously people would be defending like, well, as an owner of, you know, and CEO of a a social media company, you don't have to host anybody who you don't want to. But when it comes to Twitter, people are much more like, no, Twitter should basically be compelled to like host these people or not deplatform them. Okay, I want to reset a little bit. Uh, I don't think anyone's biting on this question. Um, Does deplatforming and censorship even work? Yes. How so? What do you mean by that? Well, if you're playing a specifically media game and you're trying to garner sympathy and followers over a vast expanse of space um, and your sole medium for doing so is via your social media account, um, removing that social media account neuters your reach. That's That seems well, pretty intuitive. Studies have wait, what out. do you mean by work? By work, because in terms of like whether or not it's like effective, obviously... It is, but whether or not you should be doing it, or like whether or not it's moral, would be a different question altogether. Uh, I think both, right? Uh, so, for example, um, they have deplatformed uh, many people on the manosphere. Many conservative voices have been deplatformed four times the rate, right? But mm-hmm. these ideas haven't gone away. If anything, they have been gotten stronger, right? It's fed into this kind of a uh, uh, oppressor narrative that they have, right? Well, so, it seems what you're, it seems the situation you're dealing with there is not that deep platforming hasn't worked; it's that deep platforming hasn't actually taken place. Someone has been removed or limited on some platform, and has meanwhile held an extreme amount of of influence on another platform. And so they've been able to rhetorically deploy the deep platforming here, over here as as a, as a propaganda tool. So what you're, you actually can't tell if the deplatforming worked at all because it never actually took place. They were removed from one medium, but they weren't actually depersoned in the way we typically tend to think of when we talk about like total deplatforming. So the, the issue here is is of like, once again, because there is no public square, these are different mediums controlled by different people whose, whose motives we, we do not fully understand. Um, because of that, uh, nobody is actually getting fully deplatformed at all. So there's actually no commitment to a policy of deplatforming any one party across the board. And this speaks again to the international uh, state of things, because even if somebody is totally deplatformed, and this is where, for example, like this actually becomes a positive. If someone is deplatformed unjustly by the state, they can nonetheless have an international voice from somewhere else. So. I want to agree. I want to agree with straight away with the idea of like, what do you mean by work? Does it, are you silencing a whole bunch of people? Uh, yeah, right? Are you preventing people from hearing they want to hearing whatever they want to hear? Yes, you are. But I think there's like a smaller subset of people who, you know, maybe they're a little bit more engaged. They take a little bit more time to research. They take a little bit more time to like be skeptical. And they find out that like, yeah, you've banned this. And that makes them more skeptical, right? Because when somebody's hiding the ball, at least for me, right? When I'm, when I'm reading an article and I, I notice that like, Paragraph after paragraph, they're not saying something, right? That's like the natural, uh, like the natural implication of what I'm looking for. Um, they're just not saying it, and then I get to the end, and it wasn't said at all. Wow. Um, my intuition is that's true. My intuition is that's true because they're not saying it, and they don't want to say that because they that that truth is counter to the actual uh, intention of the article. And so, um, yeah. So, so I think for like a smaller group of people, it might radicalize them even further, right? So, I mean, there there are like there are examples of topics where I am uh, incredibly skeptical, uh, primarily because there was so much censorship uh, regarding uh, certain things surrounding certain events that I don't even know if I can talk about on this fucking platform. So. But the censorship yeah, I... is known to you, though. The censorship is, is, is like a, a fact in your world. So they clearly haven't been totally censored because you're aware of the party that has been censored. You're aware of what they have been saying that they are not allowed to say somehow right. that because of their serious. inefficiency, because of their inefficiency, right? Like, oh, like I see somebody like posting some shit and then all of a sudden tomorrow it's gone. No, exactly. And but, but the but, but what I'm saying, though, is that the social consequences of that, when it's radicalizing people a little bit further, that's directly the consequence of deplatforming not having been carried out. 
So we haven't well, actually. No, I think we get. We don't have to have an absolutist point of deplatforming. Like, if somebody's been banned from Facebook, but they haven't been banned from like Twitter or YouTube, they've been deplatformed, but not completely, right? Well, well, sure, but I mean, the question of deplatforming working sort of assumes that it's not being undermined by some other equal platform lifting them up. If if you want to actually judge whether or not deplatform deplatforming could work, um, you know, like it's it's its function, which is to remove the platform from the person. Mm -hmm has to be fulfilled to some extent and i don't i don't see much of a strong distinction between someone's been banned off twitch but not off youtube well i mean in that we case, have audiences like that bleed into of, each other yeah but our definition of deep platform then basically has to be like is somebody getting killed or not right because unless you're actually murdering somebody you're not going to completely remove them like everybody's gonna be able to make some kind of account on well Gavin how about how about stefan or... how about stefan molyneux so he's been removed from like a, a wide variety of things mm -hmm. simultaneously and his his influence is dead yeah, but he could probably still make an account on Rumble. I don't think he's been there, right? Yeah, but Rum Rumble ha is, is a recent thing, right? That's so. Once again, like once it's or, undermined yeah, by another platform, social, sure. right? I'm saying that like so he's not really so in your definition he's not truly deplatform because he could make an account elsewhere. He just hasn't, right? But the uh, issue is like with yeah. these manosphere types that have been deplatformed, they there is always obfuscation. So like Steven Crowder, for example, so he went around saying calling carlos maza like uh, a lispy queer and maybe even like the f-slur um but he would make it sound like oh i was deplatformed or whatever because of like dangerous ideas or something like that and it was like no i mean you were deplatformed because you were harassing somebody on the basis of their uh sexual orientation or like sneeko for example i think the, the thing that got him on youtube was not because he was talking about pickup artistry or like red pill ideas wasn't it because he made a rape joke basically against another like female content creator like regardless no, of what it, it really, was, and that's gonna get you swatted i think for it was a covid misinformation that eventually got him uh, okay. or, or or election denialism or something is one of those things Lactoid like studies. So early, uh, a few months ago, we actually did uh, a bit of a research dive into a bunch of studies that were looking at the effects of deplatforming on radicalization. Yeah. And uh, so here's the thing. One of the side consequences of deplatforming in this otherwise neuter sense, where it's, they're off one platform, but not another, like a general, a general culture of if you say X, Y, and Z in this particular manner, you will be demagnified or you will be removed that kind of thing. One of the consequences of that is that uh, people who have ideas or who have arguments that would otherwise run afoul of the censors now are forced to pad them out. So they mm -hmm. either have to couch them in, in more acceptable terms, right. they have to limit the extent of their claims, and they have to like remove language uh, like slurs, for example, which would have the efficient effect of depersoning like certain groups or of helping people sort of target their anger on yes. specific okay. parties. Okay. Let, let me be more more specific because I think we're all missing it. Um I understand that you can hurt someone individually. You can No, 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 no. there there was I, I was I was getting to I was getting to a point with this though. So okay. what they actually found with the studies is that as a consequence of this, um the actual growth of uh monitored extremist spaces online was stunted entirely. They became more extremist because less dilute, because fewer moderates were finding them. But as a consequence of them having to sanitize their rhetoric in order to stay on these mainstream platforms, their efficacy in, in bringing together a bunch of people and of radicalizing them in mass was sharply diminished. Even though they have like the talking point now of like they're coming for us, because that's all I see for like from the people pretty much anywhere who's who have been like deplatform, right? You have like Tate who's ranting about like how the matrix is coming to get him. And uh, I mean, Crowder talked about it too. Oh, that's been around forever. Right. But like, there must be some, I don't know. There must be some kind of uh, yep. beneficial Even, but, reason for pointing that out. They don't like, I mean, I feel like, again, I'm more principled that like, just because they personally don't follow the spirit of it themselves, I don't think that they should be frivolously deplatformed, but fresh and fit was going around. I'm pretty sure just, spamming copyright claims to all of these channels that they didn't want to engage with the criticism of. Abin Preach was one of them. They hit them they attempted to hit them with like 20 frivolous copyright claims in an attempt to like quell criticism, but then they turn around and say like oh people are trying to cancel us or whatever. So, it's not even like they have some principled opposition to like cancellation or whatever. They just as soon do it themselves if 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 they could, you know. That I think that's a separate uh, issue, right? Like, I don't think anyone, I don't believe almost anyone is is actually for uh, free speech. I think they're for their free speech, and their enemies need to be silenced. 
Um, That's not completely true. Um, so there was recently a poll that just mm. came out and now we're controlling for students, right? So let's just, I understand it's like a different demographic, but at least in my state, among my public university uh, system, um, the disparities between uh, political beliefs and like which political demographics were okay with people of the opposite political demographics uh, speaking their mind and talking about what they believed and uh, whether or not their ideas were dangerous and whether or not those ideas should even be allowed in the first place or whether or not administrators should step in if they say things that pushed forward this particular agenda, um, the, the differences were stark, right? Like generally speaking, it appears at, at least in my state, but I think I, I would be confident enough to say this across all of America, that like the right tends to be a little bit more tolerant here when it comes to like accepting other people saying their shit, as long as they get to say their own shit as well. Yeah, but maybe I that's because- I think that is absolutely not true. Um, I, was... I think that the right is just as, if not worse than the left when it comes to censoring speech. The only problem is right now they're losing. So of course the far, the far right or like just one of the middle no, like normal stock conservatives. Well, I was Super. just so, just to add to that very quickly. Let's assume that you're right, Lactoid. Okay, is there a commence? Is there an equivalent study that also shows like how many of those people also actively advocate for the marginalizing of entire groups of people? Like well, for, maybe well, the reason. Just, even ignoring that, I mean, just real more. quick on the on the freedom of speech thing. Conservatives, when when they have the ability to censor, like. It's funny because we can say like, well, here's a poll. Conservatives right now are actually more tolerant of other points of view than um, that than than progressives are. I think it's just because conservatives are on the losing side of it. If you look at where they do have power, like what are they trying to do throughout states? Ban medical treatment for adults related to trans stuff. Ban books from different schools. Um, Matt Walsh and I think Ben Shapiro was retweeting that somebody uh, Lizzo should be arrested for having performers on stage fully clothed in drag. Right. That's like more authoritarian than most left leaning stuff I've heard recently. So I think when conservatives do have the power, they will flex it in highly um, and, and highly censorship prone ways. They just right now they don't. So I, I, I think, think, I think there's made... a lot of context behind some of the things that were just said. When we're talking about like the banning uh, books in uh, with, where kids are like elementary school libraries. I think that's completely different, like controlling. Why? Things. What's the difference? Well, because the difference is. When we mandate that children go to education or are educated, right? We, we enforce that as a law. Um, like if it's a public school education, it would make sense that the public gets to have a little bit of a say as to what the kids are being educated on, right? There's, yeah, there's, there's, this, this, is, this is not like a freedom of expression like issue when we're like dictating what books get to go like in an elementary school library necessarily compared to what uh, a college campus system, which is supposed to be the like where ideas are challenged, where you have the vast majority of left-leaning people who think that right-leaning right -leaning people should not be able to say their ideas, or if they do, kicked off campus, right? Okay, it's so totally different uh, magnitudes. What I was going to say, actually, uh, thank you, Destiny, for that. That dovetails very nicely with the point I was trying to make. Um, it may be the case that they appear on paper to be more accepting of other uh, people espousing their ideas because they're presuming the depersoning of most of the people they actually care about in the first place. So... Once again, they're, as, as Stephen adequately put, like immediately once in power, their uh, immediate go-to is ban the books, ban discussion of X, Y, and Z, terminate these university departments, and so on and so forth. They say, they say like, hey, we're for the, the equalizing of the university, want more diversity of thought. But in practice, that's just because they only view diversity of thought as being between uh, a few liberal professors on campus and Tucker Carlson. No. And no. conservatives, conservatives totally dug their own grave with this one, because if you are championing like deregulation, right, the thing that would actually keep more conservatives on social media would be more regulation, would be more of an incentive or compulsion for these private media groups to host them. So, you know, you can't have that one both ways. And then didn't Trump, by executive action, attempt to revoke 230? Right, I know it wasn't enforced. He was, so he, was he was threatening it. He, he was threatening it unless like the social media companies didn't um, like didn't what he believed to be like be fair, right? Start being yeah, fair. Yeah, but like what he doesn't even way. they couldn't even enforce it because they didn't know how to go about. What, Trump also this, said he wanted to open up libel laws to sue mainstream media. He also tweeted yeah, he yeah. wanted to put people in jail for yeah, <laughs> or fair. revoke their citizenship for um, burning a flag. So yeah, I don't Man, know. I just, no, no, no. I, I don't just like, tr I like a Trump, but I would consider him to be like a little bit further right. Um, I'm just going off of like your run of the mill conservatives compared to like your run of the mill uh, liberals or left wingers. I don't know. Um, for some reason, lefties don't like to be called liberals because of the classical implication. Um, but 
you, I, I think what I see is that, yes, there seems to be like a pretty like milquetoast conservative onus on controlling what ideas children get, especially outside of the family unit. Um, I think that's just when we're talking about children, like with most things, that's just fundamentally different when we're talking about expression of one's body or expression of one's mind or expression of, of any ideas that you want to share with somebody else. And a college campus, like a system, um, is just, I think, different, again, than like an elementary school classroom or uh, like a drag show where children are, you know, in the audience, which that seems to be like, those are the rallying points in which conservatives are like getting pissed off. So you um, think... I, the flag thing, the flag thing, by the way, that seems to be like, I, I don't disagree with you that that's a weird fucking, like, despite believing in the First Amendment, I think more strongly and being better on free speech generally... For some reason, that fucking issue, the conservatives are not as good at. Well, so the better on... Just real quick. I, I, don't, I just don't believe it. I don't buy it. Because it feels like conservatives will start with these things, but they use it as a pretext to always go a little bit further. So, for instance, you say it's just about kids. Okay, fine. Well, then why are states trying to ban um, hormone treatments for adults? Right. Or people say it's just about kids being exposed to drag. OK, fine. Well, then why are some states like Texas trying to get the entire state to ban all drag performances? Like even without children in the audience, like I, it feels like it's always a pretext to go further. And it feels like, oh, you actually don't care about freedom of speech or even kids. This is just the pretext you're using to start to like insert your anti-free speech ideas. The same Sunday, you'll get your turn. I promise you. You talked a no, lot. No, I okay? won't. This is a far circuit. Okay. So, so, th th so, what was just said is news to me. I quick Google every single link is saying. Uh, restricting sexual conduct and drag in front of minors like very consistently that seems to be every single uh all right let me check i could be wrong on that now now if it's by the way if it is true that there's tennessee like, becomes first u.s state to ban public drag performances in front of minors or just generally um it says well the word drag does not appear in the bill it changes the definition of adult cabaret in tennessee's law to mean adult oriented performances that are harmful to minors but I don't know if they're saying it, it's only banning them in front of. Yes, people. no, I've read that bill, and that's like that fucking that fucking bill is like one of the most misrepresented. Like multiple times, people ask me, "Well, doesn't this mean that?" No, no that's it, it's basically cat, uh, classifying like sexually explicit drag shows under a adult cabaret, cabaret performance, so minors aren't allowed to be there. Again, Wait, it also consistently. Says, hold on, to be clear, it says it also says male or female impersonators now fall under adult cabaret among topless dancers, go-go dancers, and exotic dancers. The bill bans adult cabaret no. from public property or anywhere minors might be present. I don't even I don't even have the bill up, but you're missing you're missing a sentence when you say um, like people performing as the other uh, as the other gender or like cross dressing. There is a a section there which is I forget the exact word they use, but the trans the legal translation is in a sexualized manner, right? Which is the oh, exact. Oh, so you trust the government to determine when a dress is is dressing up in a sexualized no, manner. No, no, if, so, if someone's behaving in a sexualized manner, it's the exact same, like, tests that we use to but determine whether or not what does that mean? Children. Yeah, it's a, the, a trans it's, woman in a belly shirt, is that yeah, yeah. What's the in a what, sexualized manner? You're right. Like, what is ultimately, like, the sexual, like, the sexual nature of, like, a strip club? Like, like what, what, where is the line between, like, breastfeeding and stripping, right? There is, like, again, like, with the definition of pornography, with the definition of sexuality, there is, like, a gray area. And it's, it's very difficult, right? But, like, one of the concepts here is, um, and how this is going to be enforced, uh, I, I guess I predict, I can't know for sure, but if it's enforced, how would that word is enforced everywhere else in Tennessee? It's going to be whether or not this is a sexualized performance. If you're gyrating your hips like together in front of a bunch of like five-year-olds, maybe that's a problem. I don't think that's like on par with like restricting freedom of speech in terms of banning university like Republicans from like hosting ideas that left-wingers don't like. Wait, what was the, what was that important sentence that you said was missing? Hold on, I'll bring up the actual bill. Okay, while he does that, right? Uh, do we think, like, uh, that um, ideas or books should be banned for children? Like, specifically, is outside of the sexual realm, let's remove sexuality from this. So, other than sexuality, do you think we should be banning concepts like uh, teaching about the Holocaust or or anything like that um, from children's libraries or schools uh, under a certain age, like kindergarten. Like, should kindergartners be learning about the Holocaust, right? Is this a free speech issue, though? I feel like this is just going is to come not? down to, like, uh, well, curriculum. Well, well like, like I, I mean, it's not necessarily a censorship issue, though, to say, like, for example, 
we shouldn't be teaching like issues around sexual assault to people in grade one. That doesn't necessarily mean that we should make like materials unavailable to for whatever reason, like somebody in grade one who has reason to research this topic. Um, but I don't think it would necessarily be appropriate as a part of a curriculum. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but uh, as I understand it, the Stop Woke Act doesn't just remove it from the curriculum, but removes it from school libraries and things like that. Is that incorrect? I mean, the own? removal from the library would be bad, but I don't think that, like, um, you know, educators making the determination that kindergarten is not the appropriate grade level for students to be learning about, like, certain historical events is tantamount to, like, censorship or book burning or anything like that. I, th I think well, the minor I, I status the of, of the kids involved is kind of an issue here. Can we move this up a couple grades? Because now we're talking about like traumatizing kids versus <laughs> curating what's appropriate for people to learn first, right? Well, I think the... Oh, sure, okay. And I, I would like to quickly, if I, just because I found, the, I found the sentence, right? So it's about whether or not it appeals to a prurient interest, which is a sexual interest, whether or not it appeals to sexuality. Wait, wait, wait. Um, but is it? But does it? Is it now classifying that men and women that cross dress are essentially doing so? Can you link what you're looking at in the group chat? Yep, absolutely. Let's see this. We got to find yeah, out gotta, together, gang. I got to do it on my phone. I mean, I, 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 I'll, I'll put learning it. Learning with lactoid. Yeah, I'll, I'll post it because again, like, it's kind of interesting though. Because uh, let's it's just it. say I'm right. It, let's just say I'm right. Technically, you all just participated in misinformation. Maybe you should get banned, right? Well, was it a according to disinformation, uh, right? I think disinformation would be what you're promoting if you got this wrong. Well, this is this, this is, is, this is question, from right? the Tennessee website, right? Did you, wait, you didn't make a group chat, or I'm not part of it. Oh, I forgot yeah, to add you. I'm sorry. Group chat. Ouch. <laughs> sorry. I was looking for it. I was. I had. Uh, I had. Uh, unfortunately, uh, again, lactoid is the last minute replacement. Um, so. Who's this Gideon person, by the way? They're um, welcome to come in. Wanted it. No, I think he's just trolling. I don't know why. I thought he was right. seriously wanted it. I don't know what he'd have to add to this discussion, but he'd be welcome to do so. Um, I guess while we're getting that up, and I All think right, he just posted it there, let me see if I can't share it with a... This is a whole... Do you have a line or something Jesus I can Christ. go to? Yep. So how this works is you have to... This bill history amendments video and then click on summary. If you go to bill summary, it explains what the bill is, right? So this bill creates an offense for a person who engages in an adult cabaret performance on public property or in a location where the adult cabaret performance could be viewed by a person who is not an adult. Good. The bill defines... Okay, go on. Sorry. The bill defines an adult cabaret performance to mean a performance in a location other than an adult cabaret a strip club, that features topless dancers, go-go dancers, exotic dancers, strippers, male or female impersonators who provide entertainment that appeals to a prurient interest or similar entertainers, regardless of whether or not performed for consideration. So if a trans woman wears a slim-fitting dress and sings on a stage outside of a cabaret environment, would they run afoul of this? No, because the actual entertainment is not one that appeals to a prurient interest, which is well. A that's a matter interest. of judgment, no. Like the reason why I say form-fitting outfit is precisely because a form-fitting outfit is one that shows off your form. That's okay. directly appealing to a prurient interest. <sighs> so they're not wearing a. They're not I don't. Wearing I don't like know a, if I want to debate the the the. But then, right, but, 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 like, but right here's the thing: if, if we want to play like ultimate skeptic, there you could also read that technically anybody who wears a slim-fitting dress then it goes to sing. Could technically be uh they're violating this and so therefore we can't have rules against strippers right no you're misunderstanding me you have an interest in 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 this being much more specific because your position is that it's a bad thing that for example along similarly ambiguous lines conservatives are being removed from social media oh hold on i want to fight over this for a second um go ahead sure, sure. i I, 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 I disagree. I think that I think that a Republican would say that every drag so, show is necessarily sexual. I think that they would just say that. Well, the question is what qualifies as a drag show. So I wouldn't necessarily trust a Republican to distinguish between people. A, 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 a person saying I'm going to do a reading time in the square dressed in drag because for any. No, no, no. no but the question, the question. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Wait, wait. I want to lactoid. OK, hold on. Lactoid. There is no case that anybody in any of these outfits an exotic dancer, a go-go dancer, a stripper could go and do anything else and it wouldn't be considered something that appeals to prurient interests, right? They'd still consider it as such. No, that that's the disagreement we have. So the well, entertain the entertainment so itself say, the entertainment okay. itself has to appeal to prurient interests. So if you're going sure, so to drag queen if you're, 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 hold on. if you're going to drag queen reading hour, 
Like yeah. reading to kids, is that like a, is that sexual entertainment? What about strippers playing volleyball? So strippers playing volleyball, are they like, I guess it depends. Like, are they nude while they're playing volleyball? No, are they like wearing strippers, pasties? Though. Are they pants, wearing strippers. pasties? Sure, they've got pasties. They're dressed as strippers. It says strippers in the bill. They're dressed as strippers. Yeah, would we allow this like in a public area now? I'm asking you by the language of the bill, the stripper is banned from doing so. Not because it's necessarily doing a strip show, well, also but because the go -go of the dancer. outfit. What? Well, also like the go-go dancer, right? Would probably so, be as well, yeah. Right, right. So, so again, like this is one of the issues we run into when it comes to defining pornography or like defining like sexual grooming or any of this shit, where like it, it does rely a little bit on like, now you might just not trust like the, um, the, the intuition or the common sense of Republicans. Well, no, no, hold on. I'm just, I'm just going um, by the legally what you've said, right? So the amendment to this bill, right? The way that this particular bill was amended was the word male or female impersonators were added to this. They, those weren't there before. That was part of the amendment, right? So if they're adding that, but you're telling me, oh, no, 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 no. It's only performances of a sexual nature. Why would you need to add male or female impersonators there? Well, I well, here, it probably wouldn't matter whether they were doing a sexual performance or not. I can, ask you, I can ask you the exact same question, Destiny, right? So uh, if they just meant that male and female impersonators are just naturally doing everything sexualized, then why did they have to include a sentence who provide entertainment that appeals to a prurian interest? Right. When people add little like modifiers, like this is like statutory interpretation. When people add modifiers to like things, what that usually means is there's an intention behind that. And when yeah, you're but appealing to a prurient that, interest, appealing to a prurient interest could mean the difference between, for example, them having to wear like full formal wear or wearing bikinis while they're playing volleyball. The reason why it could like, be argued why this, that WIC panels appeal to a prurient interest. That could be argued, right? Like, no, because some you're would here. Say. Um, so the the reason why that that matters though is because like, is it now simply the case that any trans woman who dresses in female getup is now going to be targeted as being a female impersonator who is appealing to prurient interests? Because it seems like the impersonating itself. I I don't know. Like judging by how it's discussed, it seems like that itself is equivocated with appealing to a prurient interest. This is why drag queen... Yeah. Why are they all wrong? Hour, despite the fact that they may wearing why are they all wrong? full yeah, Mary just... Poppins garb may, uh -huh. may nonetheless be characterized as, as a, like, yeah, having I'm, sexual I'm, I'm, right. for children. I'm sure and that's is, what they is meant. Is drag so, clothing even sexual in nature to you, Lactoid? So, I guess we don't know for sure how, like, well, like with every single stat, uh, statute ever, like with every statute against uh, child molestation, with every single... Uh, statute against drug dealing with every single statute against anything ever. We don't know exactly how it's going to be uh, interpreted. We don't know exactly how it's going to be enforced. We don't know the specifics of everything, you know, how the jury's rule is going to like also have like a, an impact on how these things turn out practically. I don't disagree, right? But I'm just going to tell you based on my reading of this, right? What is, what's like the proper statutory interpretation here? They're not just saying, Male and female impersonators, that's part of like strippers and that's part of everybody who has to like go under an adult Cabernet performance. They are specifically modifying that sentence with only if they're performing entertainment, the in entertainment being one of a sexual interest, one of a sexual, a yeah, I understand interest, what you're saying, right? but it feels like that and language so, is only there to say that they're like doing a show of some sort. That's what it's there for. So like a stripper walking right. in public, maybe. But my guess is going to be that the way that Republicans perceive drag is any type of show. Well, well so this is why originalism is the best uh, legal philosophy. Well, we're because, not talking originalism. I understand well, I'll explain why. I'll explain why. Because when they're interpreting this, right, the reasonable thing would do is, why did they make this? Why did they include that little thing? And what is the context of the time that they included it? Well, the context of the time was like a whole bunch of like controversy about the fact that you had like drag queen Christmas where you had like people literally wearing giant fake tits and grinding like their genitals in front of like small children, which is like highly sexual. This is a like highly prurient yeah, entertainment. My guess, my guess is going to be that stuff like that is probably already prosecutable. There's probably already bills it's, in Tennessee. No, it's not. They didn't. No, they, I they, could they, go they... in Tennessee prior to this bill, which by the way, doesn't even account for that. Let's say prior to this, I could walk up to a child and start rubbing my dick in front of a kid. And because, oh, you didn't put like the dick rubbing and sweatpants part clause in the bill, I'm not going to get in trouble for it. So, so if you, so. so yeah, if you did that specific thing, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on Tennessee, like but that any specific anti-child molestation Tennessee statutes. What I'm saying is that generally speaking in these states, like drag queens going up on stage and like gyrating their genitals on each other and wearing these great big old fake tits and acting in an incredibly sexual nature. And there was minors there. I mean, they haven't been prosecuted. And so there has been like a little bit of a backlash to this. Well, like, oh shit, 
we don't want this happening in our state or we don't want this happening in our state again, right? Because DeSantis decertified the area that did that in Florida. And then you have Tennessee who's like, well, we don't want that to happen here. So we're going to pass this bill to make sure it doesn't happen. We're going to include I mean, things like this. I super, I super don't think you're right. I don't think so. Then, then, why, did they, then why did they pass this? Why did they include they don't want, a they don't sexual prurient or a, a no, no, prurient they interest here? It's not, you're focused so much on that. That language was already there, the prurient interest. But look at what other classifications that are they're, they're being compared to, right? These things are necessarily and inherently by, their, by what they are, sexual. Topless dancers, go -go dancer. go -go dancers, exotic dancers, strippers, and cross-dressers. Like, that's being classified with all of those. No matter what performance any of those other people are doing, these people are probably going to get in trouble if they're doing a performance in a public area. It's necessarily going to be prurient interest. Somebody what's, dressed what, as a what's a go What's a go-go dancer? It's, I don't know, but it's probably some sexual what's fucking... A if What's a uh, mailer lactoid? If, 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 if it's sandwiched between topless dancer and exotic dancer and a stripper, my guess is a go-go dancer probably wears incredibly sexually provocative clothing in so far as Tennessee sees it. That's going to be my guess. Oh, she wears like a bikini and dances in front of people. And if she's dancing sexually to like a sexual interest, then that would be a problem, right? Just well, like how, how about this? Lactoid, lactoid. How about this? I'm going to give you two examples, okay? A volleyball tournament on a beach involving women in swimsuits. The swimsuits are various, whatever they brought with them from home. Some are in bikinis, some are in one pieces. Some have those weird frilly things from the 30s, okay? Prurient interest, public volleyball competition. They're at the very least showing lower leg, every single one of them. Is that appealing to a prurient interest? It doesn't matter if it's appealing to a prurient interest, because I don't think it's defined as an adult cabaret performer. That's the point, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, also, well, no, you, you would have to, like... Prove that they like that this, there's a sexual intent here. They're like they're appealing to a prurient interest, and by the way, it's a misdemeanor. So like you would also prove that like they intend to do this, right? They intended to like appeal to a sexual nature. No, no, which, I, I mean, I which, which, like... which you could do when you're like got great big old fake tits and you're gyrating your genitals in front of fourth grade. Okay, well this is this is where the other example is going from because we can imagine, for example, a sexy volleyball competition being displayed on a cabaret stage for the titillation of the audience. What if we have the exact same scenario? But they're trans women. Should kids exact be at that? same variety of dress. L let me ask you, Sunday. Should kids be at that? At a sexy volleyball competition? Should kids be there? In your opinion? Uh, well, I'm not defining a volleyball competition at the beach as a sexy volleyball competition at the beach. Say it was a wet t-shirt contest. Sexy volleyball. They're gonna do the wet t-shirt thing where that's, they wear that's, the t-shirt, get sprayed with with water, and then go out is, and do and that do event volleyball. Is coded, right. That event is coded sexually. So by dint of the branding, no. But for example, we wouldn't say that kids shouldn't go to the beach because they might encounter women with bikinis there. Or particular cheerleading performances at sporting events? No, because cheer because those people aren't called out here. The adult cabaret performance is um, is is defined well, here no, to mean a performance. What? Technically, they well, could fall under go-go dancer because a go-go dancer is a very broad category of people who dance at like entertainment venues. Well, the reason why I'm pushing back on this, Stephen, is because like a, a adult cabaret, what's intended for an adult cabaret is, is, is endless because anything can be simulated for the titillation of an audience on such a stage. It's, it's, it, there's like a massive, massive scope for interpretation there. Yeah, no, you, you've got to take a step back for a second, right? And I, I, this is one of the difficult things with like defining pornography or defining sex, like something sexualized is like you, you do have to like take a step back and look at it like, is this appealing to a primarily sexual interest? Is this appealing to a sex? Is, 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 what is the purpose of them doing this? Is the purpose of them like gyrating their genitals on each other? Is there like something sexual about that? Are they like trying to be sexual to like the audience? Is that is that entertainment is the, is the actual performance like built to appeal to somebody's sexual interest? If that's just, the case, the language added that's doesn't... different than like somebody with just a bikini, okay? Sure. Because I... That's not how it's been defined before, and that this bill doesn't change it to be defining that to sure, defined sure. that way. Adding the cross-dressing thing just doesn't make sense. They're just they're trying to ban drag, right? So I'm linking you to another part of the Tennessee Code, okay? and then they put in male or female impersonators. And then adult entertainment means any exhibition of any adult-oriented motion picture, live performance, display, or dance of any type that has a as a significant or substantial portion of such performance any actual or simulated performance of specified sexual activities, including the removal of articles of clothing or appearing unclothed. So earlier you gave the example that somebody was rubbing their crotch in front of a child's place or whatever. This sounds like a simulated performance of a specified sexual activity, so it would have been illegal before. And removing articles of clothing sounds like things you would do in regards to like a strip show, an adult cabaret. So I don't know why you would add male or female impersonators here. Any types of these sexual performances happening before, I can't think of any examples that wouldn't have already been caught under this bill. It sounds like you're just trying to ban drag. 
the reason why, and there could be like a specific intent there for sure. But again, like the reason why is because recently this has been happening more. And I think it's wrong. But if somebody right? was doing that in front of a kid, you would have already been able to charge them with a misdemeanor. I'm positive of that. There's no shot that I could go up in front of a kid. As long as I'm dressed like a man, I can do sexual activity, simulated sexual activities in front of the child and be okay. That's got to be, you can't have to pass an anti-drag amendment to existing legislation to make that illegal. There's no so, 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 so hold on, is your argument that it's redundant or is your argument that it's um, no, no, no. My like anti-free speech? Is, like, my what argument is, is that in your world is pointless because your interpretation doesn't make sense. In my world, they're just trying to ban all public performances of drag, in which case it makes perfect sense. They're trying okay. to ban drag. Otherwise, why would you add, like, why would you add cross-dressers to topless dancers, go-go dancers, exotic dancers, or strippers performing adult entertainment, like simulated sexual acts or removing articles of clothing to appear unclothed? Yeah, yeah. Like, so I'll explain. Uh, no, no. I'll, uh, sure, sure that's, that's one way of taking a look at it, okay? I just think the context of when this came out is very different, right? This was okay. like right on the heels of, at the time, like a number of incredibly sexualized and provocative drag performances in which there was children in the audience. And what people, and, and, and people, and people, there was a, they had a whole tour, right? You can to look be it clear, up. Drag, I don't, drag I don't, queen, Christmas. I, this, I don't think this happened. I, 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 I can How link you that too. How does sound like a moral panic, like Lactoid? I don't think I don't think this ever happened. I don't think that there were I think that this is my guess is going to be there's pictures from the shows or different shows and there might have been kids in the audience and people were making sexually suggestive things. But I don't think somebody was doing a highly sexually suggestive thing right in front of a kid. And there's not a misdemeanor statue that you couldn't charge that person. Or. I don't well, think they, they were doing it. On, there was, no, 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 no. They were doing it on a stage and there was children in the audience. Okay. Yes. Okay. Lactoid. Lactoid. Let's assume that that is completely true. Once yes, again, back it is. to Stephen's point. No, no. Google Once it. again, back to Stephen's point, even if that is completely true, the reason why that would be a problem is because because they are engaging in simulated sexual activity in front of an audience. The wording of what you just posted suggests that the bare fact yes, of, of dressing that. in the garb traditionally associated with the opposite sex counts as cabaret -like, a cabaret-like performance. It, it seems like, not just you want to ban drag, it seems like you want to ban any male-bodied person from appearing in public wearing a dress. Any cross-dressing person, or at least yeah. doing any type of performance, not just appearing there, because it seems like a stripper could walk in public, but when it comes to doing any sort of performance, it feels like any performance relating to drag, because this has been added it, inappropriately, I, I'm at it, it doesn't, because it doesn't, it re, like if you read this, if you read this section, none of this sounds like it has anything to do with people cross-dressing. Is this still I think we've, uh, <laughs> we butted heads on this one a while. It's a little tangential, but you know what? It was interesting, I think. I think different interpretations does play into the ultimate point, right, of, of tech censorship. Um, <laughs> because it doesn't really matter what your toss or moderation policies are. What matters is who is enforcing those moderation policies, who is interpreting those moderation policies. And given that that's the case, right? Does the government have any interest in regulating uh, what can and cannot be censored on a tech platform or on a social money, media platform? And uh, do you think that they should uh, step in and, and, as Texas, I believe, tried to do, uh, stop uh, social media companies from banning you or something over uh, infractions. What are you thinking? We're licking, we're licking these things in a weird way. Um, like the immediate cases that come to mind when we talk about whether or not government has an interest in, in uh, interfering with the censorship of social media sites is, is for example, like China uh, going through like Gmail accounts and, and things of that sort and, and censoring discussion of particular topics, once again, in, in the name of its national self-interest. Um, these these often run contrary to each other. Like the, the the government interfering with social media is very rarely in defense of of citizens' rights. It's it's more often having to do with you know the control of information that it deems to be sensitive to its own interests aside from those rights. I mean, our own president Joe Biden has called for this back in 2019 when he was a candidate. He was arguing for the uh, revocation of Section 230. I think it was on the basis that he said these companies are helping promote and propagate falsehoods that they know to be false. Uh, like, is that something that you guys support, the revocation of, uh, of Section 230? No, of course not. Yeah. No, but I, I'm saying there's already, like, uh, like there are government officials right now, currently even our, like, sitting president, who think that there is a compelling interest for the government to step in and begin trying to, like, moderate these platforms, I guess, to promote in, in the interest of promoting truth, I suppose. Um but that doesn't really capture the spirit of the First Amendment. I don't think the spirit of the First Amendment is to promote truth, necessarily. 
Interesting. Fair enough. Um, okay. We are kind of winding down a little bit. I do have one more. Can, can I ask one question? Please, please, if you have something to, to go for, go ahead. For you guys. Um, and I love this example because it's like one that also like uh, is very consistent with my strong capitalist beliefs. If you have a situation in which, let's say you had a large social media company that said that they were not shadow banning. Okay, let's just say. They, they, they came out and they said, like, they, they advertised to their consumer base that they were not shadow banning. And then la later it came out uh, that they were, right? It came out that actually behind the scenes when they were hiding in the shadows, they were actually, like, shadow banning certain uh, people, more, you know, more often conservatives. But let's just say generally speaking. Um, and we're, we're just for clarification before you continue. We're it's hypothetical. This is like, well, it's hypothetical, yes. But we're taking this shadow banning to be not the accidental consequence of algorithms you know, un insufficiently understood or monitored, but like a deliberate policy, we have emails exchanged that show, hey, we want to ban X, Y, and Z, but not tell them. It's, it, yeah, it's designating certain people as like having less right. amplification, um, it's shadow banning, right? Like reducing uh, the visibility. Um, if, if this happens, when they say, when they promise that they're not doing it, do you agree that this would be some kind of fraud and they should probably be liable to the people that they lied to? No. I think if it was a paid service, maybe you can make an argument for that. But I think shadow banning, quote unquote shadow banning, is it's a very specific term and people like play around with these terms in terms of marketing all the time. So I think it's kind of silly to try to pretend that there's like a stringent definition or example of what shadow banning means or what shadow banning is. I don't sure, think man. there's a I don't think there should be some kind of obligation on people offering a free service to be transparent about about what's going on behind the scenes. Um, I think when we're talking about people who are accepting a TOS um, that maybe like a, as a, as a part of their signing up process or because they pay for some kind of feature, they're guaranteed access to some kind of like good, whether that's like, Hey, and we will boost your, your profile against others that haven't paid for the service. I think in that case, you'd have a case for fraud, but unless there's actually like some kind of explicit relationship like that, this strikes well, me as no different than for example, like somebody banning people from a discord server, uh, for, for reasons of personal judgment. We, we call these things free right but that's only because we don't pay money for them it's not like as if they come at no cost i mean they yeah do but you're not you're not data. you're not buying they do use our not... data they do use uh we are the product right we are the the cost like we are giving in, in, access in, to ourselves right? in a sense but you are not selling your data as a currency for the thing you are agreeing to them being allowed to read your data while you're using their site that and is given that you well, are that doesn't fall under terms of service though that's a privacy policy which and these two things are, are distinct i think a privacy policy is just going to outline to you how a company is like interacting and like harvesting your user data but the terms of service is going to be something distinct from that no Sure, but when you say that like free company, like companies that are free uh, have no obligation to be honest to their user base. Again, the agreement is being made, uh, like a, a tacit agreement between both parties is being made, known or not. Right, you're agreeing to let them use your data, and they are agreeing to uh, not uh, just arbitrarily moderate you or arbitrarily ban you and things like that. And at least in most cases, as I'm aware, well, are they agreeing to that? Can't they ban you for whatever reason they want? I don't know if they're agreeing. Well, to as far as like how the courts recognize it, if a company outlines the rules and their terms and conditions, and there's an affirmative like click or agreement that you have to do that says, I agree to this, or I've read this, and then you proceed to use their site. If there is within those rules something that says, we can change this at any time that you want, they can't actually enforce that as a meaningful contract because then you would be co-signing and affirming that you will like continue to agree. Like you're agreeing to a contract that you've not yet seen. So those are null. But if they are regularly updating them and having you affirmatively check, I agree to the updates, I agree to the updates, then those are enforceable. Okay. Interesting. I, I'm not sure the, the, the law behind that. Um, but to like to it's a larger point, right? Like, again, if you because people use Twitter and people use uh, Twitch, YouTube, all these other streaming sites for their business, like people's livelihoods are uh, tied to this. They go on to these sites and they become involved and creators on these sites and use these sites in order to make money, in order to, to live, right? Um, do the companies have no responsibility to be honest 
with the people using their services for this purpose? Well, you're asking if they have an ethical, if, if there's some kind of... Yeah, it's like, I'm not pressure. talking legal. I'm talking ethical. Well, I, well so my, my question was, like, legal, right? And mm. I, I, think the, I think the answers are crazy, right? So I can imagine a scenario in which, let's say, I put, like, I put out an ad uh, where you get a free car um, if you come and watch 50 hours of ads, right? And then at the end of the at the end of you dedicating dedicating a significant amount of time watching ads and like being in this space that I've created, um, then like I you no know, you don't get the car actually. What's the, the what's the free car that Twitter offered conservatives? So when you come out and say we are not doing this, like we are just not doing this, but then like so what you this what this entices a bunch of people to come onto the platform and watch their ads. Right, become like a money making device for the company. And then it turns out they're doing it. It would seem to me that like there's Has a little bit of 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 a little bit I guess maybe a reiteration. Do you really think that like if a, like any kind of one of these free social media companies can just flat out fucking lie to like bring users into their platform and then not deliver on what they're saying? I don't Isn't know. That, that, that kind of weird. Let's say on my website, let's say that I say, if you subscribe tier two, I'll give you a free hug if I say you or something. And then let's say I'm like, I'm not doing that at all. That's just a total scam. Is that like, or, or not tier two actually. Yeah, whoa, whoa, it should be. It should wait, be. Wait, wait, hold on, because we're not talking about paid things. I'm sorry. What if you come into my chat and I say like, oh yeah, if you sign up for a thing on my website and you come chat, I'll give you a hug if I see you. And I was like, I'm like, no, I just lied. I totally lied. Just get more people to sign up. Is that is that illegal? What is the law? I have no idea. I'm not actually sure. I don't think so I don't think Twitter saying not they're not going to be, but I think it should be. But hang on, I don't think Twitter saying they're not shadow banning people um, entails that they are promising that if you break TOS or you commit slurs or you engage in like pernicious language. That therefore they will, they, they are obligated to promote you commensurately with other people who don't do those well, things. Well, here, this is what I, this is why I'm asking what he means by shadow ban. Again, yeah. shadow ban is a contentious term, right? I think in the most strictest sense, shadow banning means that you're removing somebody's access to the site almost completely without them knowing it. So that means that nobody else can see their tweets, nobody can go to their profile, they have no idea, and they've been basically completely delisted, but it's a shadow ban, the person's not aware of it. Yeah, so, so for example- Wait, wait, so first, just real quick, but I think, so Twitter does things like they de-boost people, or they might deprioritize people, or hide them from certain people's feeds, and it's arguable whether that constitutes shadow banning. That's why I'm asking what specifically did Twitter say they didn't do. And the comparison I'll always use is for cell phones. Cell phone companies today, every single provider will not say that they're throttling. They don't say they're throttling. What they'll say is they deprioritize you after you've used 21 gigabytes or whatever data. It's essentially the exact same thing. And if you're not wanting to get throttled, you are going to get throttled. But they call it deprioritization on the tower based on how much data you've consumed. So I want like this. Let me read this yeah, statement. So if we want to move away from hypothetical and actually get to Twitter. Yes, please. Is, like, obviously, it's based on. Answer uh, the question. Is, yeah, this is the statement that was made, right? Uh, people are asking us if we shadow ban. We don't. I think the real question behind the question is, are we doing something according to political ideology or viewpoints? We are not, period. We do not look at content with, uh, with regards to political viewpoint or ideology. We look at behavior. Okay. Is that wrong? So uh, from what I read from the Twitter files, I only read those, I guess, only specific parts. And from what I read, they were deprioritizing people based on their political beliefs. Well, I guess What's it depends it, on whether or not I get. I guess it. I guess it. I guess it depends on whether or not you consider someone, for example, like uh, spreading uh, untoward statements about, say, black communities, to be a political belief, or whether or not that's that's just like an aggression on a community that's 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 not. I want. I want to. I want to hear the the back and forth a little bit more from Destiny and and Lack. Yeah. Or yeah. No. No. That that was that would have been the question I was going to ask. That was okay. President Sunday asked because this is the issue that conservatives keep running into. Okay. I'll go into a platform. I'll spam the N word and then get banned. And I'll go. They're censoring me because I'm conservative. Conservatives think you should have freedom of speech. That's the issue. My understanding is I've never seen somebody banned from Twitter for political ideology, but you guys will say things like disagreeing with the COVID narrative. Um, that's part of my political ideology, which I think is a fair point. But it feels different to say I'm banning conservatives. Like that statement seems to take on a different character versus saying I'm banning somebody because of their political ideology versus like COVID misinformation or something, right? That's the issue, I think. So, like, no, I feel no, like no, I no, it's, it's identical, right? If you're if you're making like vaccine skeptical content, and they specifically said we do not look at content, then they're looking at content, which they said they didn't do. 
No, no, no. They said political content, didn't they? They're not going to say not looking at any content. They probably said political content. I'm really going to look at the statement again. Something like that. With regards to political viewpoint or ideology. Yes. So then my question, because here's my next question, because if I read well, it, how well, if I read it how you're reading it, couldn't I arguably say every single ban on that site is due to some sort of political ideology? Every ban on every site is due to some sort of underlying political ideology, no? If, we, if I think I, I, freedom sure. of speech is a principle thing, yeah. So right, right. If, if you want to be like hyper pedantic, but like, well, no, no, no. This, that's this, this, this one, this one, this, this once again goes back to like the spirit of like what were they saying when they say we do not do this, we do not deprioritize people um, or like shadow ban people based on like their political affiliation based on like their their what they're saying right or yeah. not, not what, what the content I, I right not necessarily saying. the behavior yeah. I understand what and, you're and, and they were doing that no, let's let's look at the spirit okay let's use our full brains okay twitter is saying that they're not banning people based on their political points of view and you're saying like oh that's not true because you guys are banning for covid aren't you? of course they're banning for covid misinformation they've already said that they're not hiding that but they're not banning you because you're a conservative a liberal could go on and spread that quote-unquote misinformation or a conservative could go on and spread the misinformation they're not banning you based on your political point of view they're banning you based on what they have in their tos as stuff that they don't allow on the platform which is covid misinformation election misinformation as they define it right it's not based on your political point of view it's based on violating those parts of the tos yeah vaccine disinformation is nonpartisan. anybody could perpetuate it also lacto do you think that the algorithms themselves are perpetuating bias what algorithms think, themselves are perpetuating bias is that what like is against conservatives on twitter and getting them disproportionately banned or shadow banned or or targeted i i guess i wish the algorithms would be more transparent so i could like know for sure in what ways i mean it it certainly feels so um like well, um i i don't know i guess th this one I, I have a little bit less this is more of just like a gut feeling where it, it does appear that um, people say, well, we're just gonna like, we're gonna expand like the list of like words or phrases or like protected groups of people to like start including people who like, especially when it comes to class, for example. Um, I think recently, um, like one of the new TOS from Discord was like, you can't, um, you can't discriminate against somebody based on where their income is. You know, and now if where your income is is from like government make program. Four jokes? Oh, no. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing, right? Like, well, if your if your income is from like a like a government program, well, this is inherent. Like, this is inherently going to put you on a direct collision course with conservatives who generally don't consider that to be like a legitimate form of income. Um, like, if that's like what you're living off of is for your income. Mm -hmm. um, I think. I think so I, I case... do think like they they do actually like I think it does in effect have that effect where. It does seem to the casting like, bias. Platforming. Yeah, yeah, it okay, is biasedly but, against conservatives. Yeah. I but think. Do you think that like your ability, like the same skills that would make somebody like a good coder, is not necessarily going to mean that they have the ability to like even detect or identify those sources of bias, and like adjust their algorithms to exclude stuff like that? Hopefully, they hopefully they would uh, adjust their algorithms to to not bias people based on or not bias. Well, really, the problem is that they're. Uh, they're like banning people or you know, shadow banning people in the first place. Yeah, the question I, I here isn't an algorithmic error. It's like yeah. this is like an intentional policy set, right? Well, I think exactly. Stephen, to that point, I think Stephen's case was actually stronger than he articulated it. So he was saying like they might deprioritize people or they might say they're deprioritizing people. My question following that from though is, by deprioritizing, do we mean that they are actively putting like a marker on this account saying this one will get de-boosted relative to everybody else? Or are they simply neglecting to boost that one in addition? And then the question becomes, are social media platforms obligated to commensurately boost every, every single voice to, to, to some to some part? That, that seems like a difficult sell for me. I believe for some accounts they were explicitly marking them as not for... But that would be like that would be like COVID were black disinformation list, stuff they were like that. Yeah. They, were black, they, were, they weren't just removing content; they were blacklisting accounts. Okay, sure, the, sure, but limiting, let's... limiting the entire the visibility of entire accounts, right? Sure, how how is that? How is that not going back to like shadow banning if you're doing it based on an account? Because that's no, not no. traditionally what shadow banning means. Sorry. Shadow banning is like on YouTube. So, for example, I've got a bunch of people spamming the N word in my chat briefly. When I block them, they can still type that on their end. They will see it in their chat, but it will not appear on my chat. That's shadow banning. So for them, it appears as if they're not banned. For me and everybody else, they are banned. That's what shadow banning is. So unless that's actually taking place, Twitter isn't shadow banning people. And that's the issue oh. with the definitions, I think. Um, yeah, okay. I think I, I maybe this sounds stupid, but I, I think that's stupid. Uh, I think that when when you refer to shadow banning, um, in I think my mind or 
most reasonable people I've spoken to. Maybe they're not reasonable. Um, but what shadow banning to me is you have an account and uh, without your knowledge, right, you are like, you are put on a blacklist, right? You are marked. And now the shit that you put out is like reduced visibility to the point of like severely restricting um, what you believe you could do uh, when you sign up for the service to begin with and you spent a lot of your time on the service. Um, so apparently Charlie Kirk was also uh, shadow banned, right? I mean, I, that's just one example um, that I've been like finding. Um, sure. now, and you have every right you know, to be upset about that. A bunch, a bunch of wrong, people. But... Well, I, th I, think, I think it's wrong because like it, it does... does it feels like a lie. We're not shadow banning, but then we're going to like create a blacklist of people where we're going to reduce their visibility to like dramatically limit their scope. And so if I'm on Twitter and I'm like, oh, I'm fine. They don't shadow ban. Okay, I guess I'm going to be treated fairly. So I'm going to continue using the service instead of going to some other okay. social media site. And so I spend hours or days or months on Twitter now okay. because I don't believe I'm being shadow banned. But then it turns out that I am. That's a, that's a lie. That's fraud. President Sunday, Here's let support. me ask you directly before you go. Before so, let yeah, me ask you. It, it, it relates to this, I promise. Okay. Okay. And this and people are giving me money to ask questions. I want to make some money here. Okay. Oh. Please, please give me money. That's what. Um, hey, what, okay. why the hell isn't my check in? Okay. I, I don't know. Uh, so it, as you said earlier, uh, the research shows that conservative voices by the algorithm are boosted four to five times. I believe is the number you used. I have no idea. Um, I don't think I said a specific number. But you did say you did, did say I? that you and Straighterade. Okay, well, did I, say I miss earlier. I misspoke. I think Straighterade might have had like a specific number for that. I I don't have that to have. I I don't know the specific number. The point is that you claim the claim was, and Twitter's research only shows in twenty twenty one that conservative ideology content is favored by the algorithm. It gets boosted more, right? Than seems to be. Yeah. Other seems to be. So given that that's the case, right? If conservative content is being de-boosted by the algorithm, does that not imply that someone is putting their thumb on the scale because the algorithm would naturally favor that, but for some reason it's not? Would that not imply at least an increased likelihood of someone intentionally no, no, putting because, their thumb on the scale? These, because these things aren't equivalent. An, an account violating TOS and getting banned of a certain description... We're not talking about average. banning. We're talking about shadow banning. We're talking about deep yeah, but, but the, banning. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I understand, but the problem is there is no actual shadow banning taking place. We're equivocating between, quote-unquote, deboosting and shadow banning. And my immediate wonder... And, I'm using and it maybe colloquially, this, not the type Wait, wait, I, no, no, I, I understand, but there's a reason why I'm making this distinction. Because if by de-boosting, we simply mean they're not applying a positive boost to some parties, then that would seem to imply that what, what we're talking about here is some kind of obligation to actually positively boost these channels. And that's a different, that's a different question. Like, it, it may be the case, even if we agree that it's completely unethical for, uh, for, for Twitter to be, like, demoting certain channels, and I don't agree with that at all, but even if we did agree with that, um, if all they're doing is simply not applying a boost to some channels that they're applying to others, that's not demoting, right? That's not a that's not a positive action that they're taking with respect to those channels. They're just neglecting them. Are they obligated to to improve the reach of those channels? That does not seem reasonable to me. Right. It's just the lack of promotion. Okay. Fair enough. Gang, we circled the drain on this. This has been an I found it was an interesting discussion. Okay. I hope you all enjoyed it as well. Um we talked about tech censorship. We talked about freedom of speech more in generally. We went for whatever reason for 30 minutes on a specific line and a specific bill and a specific state, which was fun.